today I'm going to talk about emotions and opinions. But additionally, I'm also going to talk about statistical evidence. And I'm going to argue that statistical evidence is especially important whenever we are thinking about issues that raise very strong emotions in us. So first, let's start with emotions. When you hear the word globalization, what are the images that come to your mind? Do you think of huge container ships going around the world and shipping tons and tons of goods? Do you think of financial centers operating around the clock? Or do you think, as I do, of shiny shopping malls in Southeast Asia, well-stocked on Western brands, the products for which have been produced somewhere nearby? Or does the word rather remind you of mass protests? Does it make you feel concerned, concerned about environmental damages, or concerned about shocking working conditions in sweatshops producing for the world market? All of us have very different pictures in our mind, some of them rather neutral or even optimistic, others more likely negatively charged. From all this, I would like to restrict or constrain your attention to one major element of globalization, which is international trade. And I would like to make you think about international trade. I would assume yet that you do not have very strong views on it. Actually, I would think that only one person out of every ten sitting in this theater would think that the growing trade and business linkages of Germany with the rest of the world are rather a bad thing. The other nine would consider them sort of or even very good. Now, by saying this, I potentially just made a major mistake. I used national representative opinion poll data to describe your own views. By doing that, I implicitly assumed that you are a representative slice of adult German population. I'm sorry to tell you, I'm very sure that you are not. You are a very self-selected group of people. If nothing else, you were willing to sit through a whole evening of TEDx talks, <laughs> which is a rather non-average behavior. Does it make you more or less concerned about globalization? I frankly don't know. But the point I wanted to make, that even when we are thinking about such simple issues as your opinions, it is very important to, make statistic, or to take statistics seriously in order to be able to, make me to come to meaningful conclusions. For me, it is even more important to take statistics seriously, because I am interested in understanding the effects of globalization and understanding the effects of international trade. So I, as a researcher and economist, am especially interested in the question, what does international trade bring to people around the world? And does international trade benefit people around the world? Especially, does international trade benefit poor people in developing countries? If you ask an economist this question, he would most likely tell you there must be some benefits to international trade, to a country as a whole. But he would also tell you that some people are going to gain more, others gain less, and others even lose from it. Basic economic theories predict that especially those people are going to gain from globalization, who own something which is more precious globally than it is locally. So in a high-income country, these are going to be capitalists, high-skilled workers, who are going to be the main beneficiaries from trade. In a low-income country, these are going to be low-skilled workers, who are locally plenty, but globally relatively scarcer. This simple economic argument is, lies at the bottom of the expectation by many economists that the poor should actually benefit from international trade around the world. But whether this really happens and whether this really occurs, it is an empirical question. And so in the remainder of the talk, I would like to show you some empirical evidence on this. But before going into that, first, I still would like to talk about opinions. So what you see here is basically opinion poll data, recent opinion poll data collected by the Pew Research Center, based on statistically representative um, national opinion poll surveys. On the vertical axis, you see the share of people who agree that the growing trade and business ties of their own country with the rest of the world are sort of a good thing. On the horizontal axis, you see the share of people who think that trade is going to increase wages. Each circle represents a country. The size of the circle shows you how important trade is in that country's economy. It's basically the volume of trade divided 
by the total volume of production. The first thing that you may be able to notice is that people's support for globalization is not independent of what they think about the wage effects of trade, but there is quite a bit of variation up there. So you can look at the Germans. Germans are pretty optimistic about the overall benefits from trade. That was the nine out of ten that I was using before. But they are rather suspicious and skeptical when it comes to the wage effects of trade. And they are not alone on this. If you look at most high-income countries, I denoted them in darker shaded circles, you see that people are generally more suspicious about what is going to happen to wages from international trade. As we start moving towards poorer and poorer countries, and the colors become paler and paler, you see that more and more people expect benefits from trade to occur, especially to wages. This is actually surprisingly, it goes in line with what the basic economic theory predicted, that especially workers and low-skilled workers in developing countries should be the ones who benefit from trade in terms of wages. But can we do better than this if we want to understand the effects of trade? Luckily, we can do much better than this. We have enormous amounts of data available by now, from micro level. We have data from household surveys, firm surveys, labor market surveys, from many countries around the world, from many different time periods. We can use this data in order to investigate and understand what does international trade do to people, do to the poor, do, do to inter income distribution. And so, in what remains, I'm going to present three different case studies from three different countries looking at what happens to the poor whenever a country opens up its markets to trade, liberalizes its trade regime. The first country up there is Vietnam. If you look at them, absolutely optimistic about the benefits from trade, also about the wage effects of trade. Statistical evidence proves them sort of right. In the last 15 years, in Vietnam, poverty rates have decreased considerably. At the same time, Vietnam entered the bilateral trade agreement with the U.S., gaining access to the huge American market. And what statistical studies shows us, show us is that poverty reduced especially in those regions that were producing goods for which the demand increased in the U.S. due to this bilateral trade agreement. So basically, the poor benefited from getting access to the U.S. American market. Vietnam ended up as a pretty large circle, so trade plays a twice as large role in its economy today than it did 15 years ago. Not all examples are like this. There is India. India liberalized its trade regime in 1991 by opening up its markets, reducing the level of protection considerably. But statistical studies fail to find beneficial effects to the poor, document the reverse, the find that the poor did not fare well from trade. And one of the potential reasons that these studies identify could lie in the very rigid labor market regulations, so that the poor couldn't even enter certain sectors, couldn't even enter the labor market, couldn't switch jobs and occupations when the shock hit them. The third case study I want to talk about is one I have been working on extensively, and it is from Indonesia. Indonesia is the, the world's fourth most populous country. It is an extremely diverse, quickly emerging economy. It has liberalized its trade regime during the 90s considerably. So it's opened up its markets once again to trade, reduced the level of protection, just the same as um, India did. So we are looking at these effects. It's not gaining access to a foreign market, but rather reducing protection of own markets. And what is going to happen to the poor? I would like to sketch the effects of this trade liberalization using the example of this textile worker. This is a man sitting in Yogyakarta, in central Java, on the street, and working on a batik shirt. When import tariffs go down in his country, because that's what, me what trade liberalization means, when import tariffs on textiles go down, it means that textile products get cheaper in the Yogyakarta market. Foreign textile goods get cheaper in the home market. This is going to put a competitive pressure on his production. This is going to be bad for him. This is going to be harmful for his income. So we could think that it would be very important to protect him from these effects. But additionally, many other things happen as well. Not only this shirt is getting cheaper, 
but also the yarn that he's, uses, that he's using, the fabric that he's using, potentially even the sewing machine. All these additional ch price changes are going to make his production more efficient, are going to improve his income. So you have seen there is a competitive pressure on him, which is bad for him, but at the same time there are also productivity enhancing effects, which are good for him. Additionally, he is going to adjust his consumption because some prices change this way or that way, so he's going to be able to afford more from some goods, less from others than he's used to. What we are interested in, what happens to his welfare after all these changes have taken place? So what to do about this? We could go to this man and ask him about how he was affected by trade, and you would get a very strong and powerful narrative from him. But this narrative would have still or pose us a major problem, the same thing that I encountered when I tried to second-guess your opinions about international trade. This man's experiences are very important, but they are not representative about what happened to poverty rates in Indonesia as a whole. So, in, so instead, we would have to look at larger samples of represent larger and representative samples of Indonesian population in order to understand what is going to happen to the poor overall in this country. So we did something like this. We are, going, we are looking not at uh, people, uh, individuals, but rather at Indonesian regions. And we are looking at poverty rates in different regions, as well as the number of employed, so labor, market, labor force participation rates, wages that are paid in these regions. And we are connecting all these outcomes with tariff reductions. We can do this because although the tariffs were reducing for the country as a whole, the same way, they were affecting different regions di differently, depending on what these regions were producing, what types of goods they were producing. So the competitive pressures were different, depending on what types of goods local industries were buying. So the productivity enhancing effects were different. Interestingly, the results show us that the competitive pressures are not closely statistically related to changes in poverty, to changes in wages, to changes in any labor market outcomes. So it does not look like Increasing competition affected the poor badly. At the same time, the productivity enhancing effects are closely related to labor market outcomes. What does it tell us? Basically, when firms benefited from international trade, increased their productivity, these local firms started to employ more workers, these local firms started to pay higher wages, poverty rates reduced in these regions. So overall, we see that international trade has been beneficial to the poor in the case of Indonesia. Why aren't then the Indonesians even more optimistic and enthusiastic about trade? There might be many explanations for this. But one potential explanation could be that Indonesia was also hit during almost the same time, in 97-98, by the South Asian financial crisis, which affected the poor very badly. This poses a challenge to our statistical analysis, and we have to deal with these um, additional issues. But additionally, it also shows how difficult it is to disentangle different aspects of globalization, to disentangle the, the effects of trade from financial globalization. From these three case studies, what do we learn from them? As economists, we need to make more and more of them and use the vast amounts of data available to learn under which conditions do the poor benefit from globalization as they did in the case of Vietnam, as they did in the case of Indonesia, and which conditions make them actually lose out, like in the case of India. But additionally, there is also a second message I would like you to, ha to take home with you. And this is basically when you are thinking about globalization. There are so many powerful narratives that you can go back to. You can think of collapsing sweatshops, killing hundreds of employees. You can think of kids working in coal mines. You can think of horrid working conditions. These, are, these narratives are extremely important, of course, because they focus our attention to issues that matter. But at the same time, if these are the only narratives that you take into account, then you are going to miss out. You are going to miss out on benefits to hundreds and hundreds of millions of poor who actually might have benefited from globalization. So overall, my message is whenever we have very strong emotional responses to specific issues, it becomes extremely important to give statistics a chance and to also listen to the overall evidence.
Thank you.